Imagine you're 17 years old. You wrote a fun little song, post it to TikTok, close your eyes, wake up the next morning to find 60 million views on that video. Fast forward a little bit, you're signed to a record label, uh, and by the end of the year, you've won three Grammys. Well, that is exactly what happened to Olivia Rodrigo. And this video is called The Olivia Rodrigo Effect. And what we really wanted to tie in is like this concept of overnight fame versus slow burns. In our last video, the Sabrina Carpenter effect really talked about Sabrina's career and how she was an example of, of someone who's a slow burn, how she's hitting the peak of her career on her sixth album, six, and it's because she's opening for someone like Taylor Swift and how sometimes it is so valuable to, you know, have to spend years and years putting your head down, honing your craft. But sometimes there's also these, these overnight success stories like in Olivia Rodrigo. I also think of Someone left a brilliant comment on our last video about Justin Bieber and, and Britney Spears. And, you know, overnight fame is something people dream about. But is it really worth it? And what happens to their careers? I mean, again, talking about Britney and Justin, you definitely see how difficult it was for them. So that's really what we wanted to talk about today. Welcome back to the Share Your Screen Podcast. Hi, my name is Nikki. I'm Coco. And thank you so much for our love on the last oh video. God. Guys, the last video, Sabrina Carpenter Effect, is our most viewed video of all time. <laughs> And the amount of, it hasn't even been a week and it, we have like 25,000 views or something. And the amount of screenshots Nikki and I were sending back and forth, just like <laughs> Every morning one. we're refreshing and sending the Literally. analytics and um, to all the new people here from that video, welcome. We are, we're so yes. excited to have you. Thank you for being here. I know. Um, I was, I was most happy also to see people that didn't know us from TikTok and we're just like, yeah. found my new favorite pod. I was like, wow, we're reaching a new audience as yep. well. Me too. So I wanted to quickly like document sort of Olivia Rodrigo's career to really look into like when I say overnight, I kind of really mean overnight. Like it really was crazy. And also I think it's important to consider these things when you're thinking about some of the details from our last episode and Sabrina Carpenter and how different their career trajectories were. So first, did you know that Olivia Rodrigo was on the same Disney Channel show as Jake Paul? Oh, wait, what? <laughs> wait, <laughs> yeah. It was called Bizarre Vark, and then Jake Paul got fired after two seasons. Oh, well, I'm surprised he lasted two seasons. Well, the show only lasted three. Okay. But apparently, according to The Hollywood Reporter, he was fired for his behavior, including but not limited to, this is also in the Team 10 era, mind you, lighting furniture on fire inside of a drained swimming pool, setting up dirt rake vices inside of Beverly Hills, instigating lar large crowds in residential neighborhoods outside the Team 10 house. And then when KTLA came to interview him about it, he jumped on top of the truck that was outside the house interviewing them. I remember that. And yep, that's when Disney let him go. And it's crazy because I remember that happening, but little did we know this random girl, Olivia Rodrigo, would end up the, uh, one of the leads in the show would end up being one of the most famous, a three-time Grammy winner on her first album. And it was just crazy to see that. And also, like, when you go back and look at the pictures of them, it's weird. I am I need to – please insert a photo so oh, I can watch it back. there's going to be lots of photos. I wonder if Jake Paul – I mean, he has his own, like, wrestling career now. But I wonder if he's ever, like, kicking himself. Like, if I had no, taken that more seriously. He's actually explicitly talked about it. And I think that – I mean – Let's let's look at the values between Disney and Jake Paul. Like Disney is known for being the most like tight knit. Nobody can do anything. Mm -hmm. And like a Jake, it, it was a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah, honestly. And it's really funny, though, because the premise of this Bizarre Bark show, I never really watched it. It was kind of past our times in 2016. Kind of giving iCarly vibes. The premise of the show was like teenagers who make it big by making funny videos online. OK. And I think that's why they wanted to try and cast Jake Paul in it. Yeah. Didn't work out so well. It reminds me of like when there's like an executive meeting with all these corporate people and they're like, we should do social media. And then they just are like, who's the first person we think of? And they don't even do any research. It's, <laughs> yeah. No, nothing about the actual Literally. person. They're just like, oh, this came up on Google. Let's book them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was the start of her acting career. It was it was her. I think she had done small roles before, but this was her first big role with Disney. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to 2017. Did you know Olivia Rodrigo was on an episode of New Girl? <laughs> really? Yes. She plays one of Jess's students in the show. Oh. And I'll put clips on screen. Like, it's so weird to see her as a child. Also, keep in mind, this was in 2017. She didn't even graduate high school until 2021. 
which wow. really goes to show how young she is. And I don't think people think about that, that she was literally a child on these shows. When she started High School Musical, a child still. Could you imagine the year you graduated high school being the year you put out a multiple Grammy winning album? And in the middle of a pandemic. Oh my <laughs> like it's God. Crazy. Homegirl had a, a wild 2021, which we will get to. Okay. We will get there. So fast forward to November 8th, 2019, we have the start of High School Musical, the musical of the series. And a big element of the artist Olivia Rodrigo turned out to be was kind of sprinkled into the show. She Did you know that she actually wrote two songs? Olivia Rodrigo's first two songs were not on Sour. They were actually for the High School Musical show. Um, All and I want is love that yeah, lasts. Yeah, she, she wrote it herself. And honestly, I think it was probably one of the smartest career moves she's ever made, even if not intentional, because I think it differentiated her to show that she was a very serious musician because prior to this, she only had acting roles at Disney. She was never put in a Disney production where her it was the job of her character to really sing a lot like that. And I think that this talent scouts got paid attention to this yeah. because fast forward, she doesn't get signed to Hollywood Records, Disney's label. She gets signed to Interscope and Geffen Records, which is one of the mm -hmm. biggest labels in the industry. Like Billy's under there, Selena Gomez is under yeah. there, uh, Lana. Lana Del Rey is under there. So when she started a music career and it took off as quickly as she did, she had the support system around her already. And I think that's a big reason she got that opportunity when none of the other cast of the show got mm -hmm. an opportunity like that was because she was smart enough to prove her ability as a solo artist, right? Like she literally wrote songs as part of the plot. So I thought it was really interesting. That song, I didn't watch this show, but it, that song was the first introduction to Olivia Rodrigo because I would hear it on the Pop Rising Spotify playlist and I was like, is there something wrong with me? Like it was such <laughs> a good song. I was yeah. like, who is this girl? No, totally. And and it and, and it was great. The sh people in the show loved it. And I think people really loved the show, honestly, yeah. which is why I think the when the damning rumors started, it got so crazy. I also think fandoms just go feral anytime it is like, the people are dating in the show and also dating in real life. Like the it's outer just, banks. they go crazy. I mean, think of like Brangelina of like mm -hmm. the 2000s and like, it's just anytime something like that happens, I think it's, it always gets blown out of proportion. Yeah. And the dating rumors had started in 2020. So this is mm -hmm. again, still season one of the show. But by August of 2020, Joshua Bassett was seen with Sabrina Carpenter. Mm -hmm. And January 8th, 2021, Olivia posts the driver's license TikTok. And I think the driver's license TikTok honestly should be in a museum. Like if we what had a it? museum of the internet, it was just her releasing the song driver's license. It got 60 million views in the first day. To this day, it has like 11 million likes. And it's essentially her just like walking through the song and how she wrote it and, and why she wrote it. Like it's pictures of her in the studio and it talks about how she got like the sound of the car was like samples of her mom's car. And it's a really, really sweet video, but it completely blew up. And that single TikTok was what blew her song up. 24 hours later, it was the number four song on iTunes. And I think 24 hours after that was the number one song on iTunes. And I have a few theories as to why Driver's License by Olivia Rodrigo blew up so much the way it did and put her career on the map, really. When you think about pop music of us growing up, Taylor Swift, Miley, Ariana, Justin Bieber, any of it. They were teenagers when we were teenagers, right? So like I was a 15 year old listening to 15 year old sing songs. Who are the 15 year olds of today listening to? Taylor Swift, Ariana, Justin Bieber, like all these people still who are, what, Taylor Swift just turned 33? So I think Olivia writing a song about like getting your driver's license, mm -hmm. it's such a experience and like POV that can only be written by a 17 year old girl. Like if Taylor Swift wrote a song about her driver's license, it would be weird. Mm -hmm. It would just be weird. Right. And you know, your first love and getting your driver's license are these things that feel like huge problems when you're in high school, but you literally never think about and you're as an adult, like never, not once in my, in my daily life am I thinking about either of those things. But I think that's like, why it did so well weirdly i think nobody was actually writing music that catered to like specifically what is a 16 year old going through right now you know like nobody was writing songs about getting their driver's license or, or dating in as a 17 year old and i think really like that's why she grew this young fandom so rapidly yeah no and you're like you make such good points driver's license even for me as a like i think i was in my like early 20s or something and i just remember 
the day, like listening to her song brought me back to the day I got my driver's license. I remember I like exactly. got it and then I had to drive to cheer practice and I was so proud that I was driving. My dad wasn't driving. Yeah. And like, it just like was like, oh, I remember that. Yeah. Day. For anyone older, it's a beautiful piece yeah. of nostalgia. And, and for anyone actually going through that now, mm -hmm. it's like, wow, finally, this is music that speaks to an actual yeah. experience. You know what I mean? And what you were saying about the TikTok that blew up, she was probably one of the first artists to market on TikTok. I've not said in this. as much of a gimmicky way. I have said that I think Olivia Rodrigo will go down and it's like one of the first big artists to blow up from TikTok. And I got a lot of hate from that when I made a video about it because everybody's like, she's from Disney, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, yeah, but I really think her music career blew up because of that TikTok. Like, it's not like she wrote a high school musical album you know what i mean like a vanessa like comparing mm -hmm. her to like a vanessa hudgens you know what i mean mm -hmm. vanessa hudgens first ever music was like the high school musical soundtrack yeah. hers was like very clearly a solo career and i don't think she would have gotten a solo mm -hmm. career unless it was for tiktok so april 1st we get the release of teja vu and i think that's when it really poured the lighter fluid on this sabrina joshua olivia situation and i don't really know how to feel about this retrospectively because and we've talked about it multiple times on this pod that like that was so blown out of proportion and i i felt so bad for joshua i remember he had a heart attack because he was getting so many death threats so sabrina carpenter was getting death threats. i think like that's clearly a sad situation but also i don't like i do think olivia is in the right to write about a relationship that she experienced you know what i mean yeah. i think if anything like maybe i would I would put the, like, I wish she would have spoke it up mm -hmm. and been like, hey guys, like stop. Like that's, you're taking it too far. But also I don't like, I don't antagonize her for writing the song yeah. is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I think that maybe Olivia was in a tricky situation because I agree. Like, I think like the good in me is like, I've, I've had moments where I've had followers going after certain people because they thought there was something in my, and I've had to be like, stop. Yeah. Do not do that. If yeah. you are my follower, you will not harass someone. Yeah. That's not how we function. And I think that Olivia could have spoken up. I think even Sabrina Carpenter is like death threats and like calling her like awful words. And I think Olivia was in a predicament too, where she was trying to distance herself from anyone who had been related to Disney before that. And there's, you know, a saying in like PR and marketing that you are equal to your enemies. Mm -hmm. And if you pick a fight with someone, or if someone's agitating you, whatever it is, the moment you respond, you're on their level. It's why Beyonce isn't gonna pick a fight with Prez Hilton. It would bring, and it would bring yeah. Prez Hilton up. Right. You have to like ignore. And I think it wasn't like Sabrina or Joshua were antagonizing her. I think they were victimized more than anyone. But I think Olivia probably had people in her ear saying, do not acknowledge anyone from Disney. You can insinuate it in the song, but yeah. do not say their names. Tot or also, I mean, imagine it's like, <laughs> you're just at the start of your solo career also i think by this point she probably knew she couldn't return to the show yeah so she had to like go all in on the solo thing right yeah. so you don't get to you don't really have the autonomy when you know you're gonna probably lose your job <laughs> yeah to think about everybody's feelings mm -hmm. when you need to impress this label that you just signed to a few months ago. And if yeah. the driver's license did so well as the first song, you got to release Deja Vu as the second. Like, I can't blame yeah. her for that. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure she had all of these industry people telling her, like, do this, do this, do this. It's working. Like, mm -hmm. you need to do this. You'll be a big artist. And it's hard. You know what I mean? I don't know. And again, she's 17 I, at this time, 18 at this time. Exactly. Like, I also think she probably, when writing Deja Vu, was before the driver's license single came out. And I'm sure she didn't know how big it was going to be. And that I think is that another thing with the driver's license video, even too. I really think that there was no way anybody could comprehend that, like, a random girl in high school musical, yeah. the musical, the series, was going to write the number one song in the most successful album of the entire year. She didn't even know that. Yeah, no I, one she didn't know that. that. And I think that's another thing that people weren't thinking about when they criticized her for that too. Of like, I'm like, I think she thought it was going to be heard by some people who watched the show yeah. and it was like her kind of trying to send a message to that fandom of like why they weren't mm. together anymore and like that was it probably what she thought was going to happen and that's not what happened but yeah. you can't blame her for that and also with this deja vu is the start of the taylor swift drama oh. and i went down the rabbit hole of this i found this amazing article by glamour i'm going to put a picture of it on screen and also link it in the description because i kid you not this writer deserves all the flowers in the world 
they like documented month by month of like, this is when Olivia Rodrigo was tweeting about Taylor Swift. She did an interview and said like, oh, I would love to work with her. Like it to find out like the month that the situation happened and they like stopped talking about each other. It's crazy. Uh, it's very well researched. Yeah. But in summary, like I really never heard this, that they thought Deja Vu ripped off Cruel Summer. I never understood that. I are we can we talk about how those songs are just not similar? Like I they're not about the same thing. Cruel Summer is like so happy. Deja Vu is so sad. Like I get it was like part of the bridge is kind of similar, but one, girl, all music is repurposed music. Let's also talk about it. There's a defined number of notes, okay? Yeah. Two, like, why are you a 33-year-old woman feeling the need to antagonize an 18-year-old? Mm. Like, I just don't get it. I don't know if it was Taylor, like if it was like their teams. It could be. I think it could have been their teams getting involved and then it affected both of them. Yeah. But I agree. Like I listened to Cruel Summer and Deja Vu, like ready to be like, okay, like let's hear that. And I was like, okay. I just like, don't. What? And I'm not a musician. Maybe I don't get it. But also, and I know that copyright is important to protect artists, but never not once has any person like heard, like played Deja Vu on Spotify and been like, Thank God I never have to listen to Cruel Summer again. Like, that's not the way music works. You know what I mean? I think it's just like, if you like one, you probably like both. Yeah. And they're both probably going to go in your like songs. And that's it. Everybody wins. Like, yes. It doesn't need to be a competition. And I think that, I just hate when music gets so competitive sometimes. But it, And it, there was a, Ed Sheeran had a court case that I think kind of settled a lot of this and set a precedent where he was being sued from, I believe it was Mar Marvin Gaye's camp. I'm not sure but for one of his songs and they said that he ripped it off. So in court, he brought, I think like a guitar ukulele and Ed Sheeran played, okay, this was a chord progression for my song. This was the chord progression for your song. Guess what? This was a chord progression for a song that came out three years before your song. Guess what? This is another chord progression exactly. for a song that came out 10 years. Exactly. So are you now, are you, you're suing me? Are you also gonna get sued by this person yes. and this person? Yes. It's the same exact yeah, chord progression. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. It's like a lot of the copyright comes around from like specific chord progressions mm. and or and I'm like notes to tiny yeah. parts of the song and I'm like at what like is this cannibalizing? I don't really yeah. think so. Like I don't know. And and maybe I don't know enough about the actual music production. We're not music. In. We're yeah. not musicians. Yes. But I just never liked that and then also after this I think it caused I didn't know this. Did you know that Paramore sued for good for you saying that it was a rip off of Misery Business? And that one, like, I didn't really see either. I don't see it either. I'm like, I, I think they're both, like, definitely teenage angst songs. Yeah. But, like, I don't see it. And also, again, going back to this uh, it being the labels thing, I think is very, very much true. Yeah. Because if you – I know this happens on YouTube, too. Like, any copyright claim that's ever been filed because it was on a song – it's not done by the artists themselves. Right. It's actually bots. Yeah. Mu the music industry has bots that can detect like mm -hmm. enough of a song in a video and it will flag the video. But like, that's it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so I don't know. It The whole Taylor Swift thing is weird to me, but it, yeah. I think was this example that I want to get to of the sort of like seeing the cracks in being an overnight success and when it starts to backfire a little bit. Because another thing that happened was um, she started getting a lot of media criticism, criticism, I think like after the Grammys and after she won all this stuff, um, for three major things. One, this copying artist that we've talked about, which I, again, like, I don't really see yeah. the legitimacy of the claim, but the big one I remember was her being really bad at performing. I don't know if you remember this, like yeah, the I first, Radio. yeah, like everybody was so excited to see driver's license live. And they're like, Oh my God, it's like a heart wrenching song. She's going to mm. belch on that mic. And like, Low key, she kind of bombed. Yeah, and that's like she, okay. She is. That's it okay. is okay. And I also, to give credit where it's due, let's talk about it. This is a girl who's homeschooled all her life, yeah. then moved to LA for Disney, where she then has to pursue education like on a set. Because that's what you do was Jake when Paul. you're in film. Your coworker is Jake Paul. Already at a disadvantage. <laughs> Already at a disadvantage. And then went to high school musical where they're still homeschooled, then a global pandemic, then in this random pandemic became the most popular artist of the entire year. Of course, they don't have live practice. They literally haven't been able to leave their house in two years. Mm -hmm. And like, you know what I mean? But there was so much criticism of it. And I also think it's interesting when you compare to this guts, like campaign she's been doing for the Grammys right yeah. now. All of it is performances. Have you noticed that? Oh. She's been doing tiny desks. She showed up to the Academy to do a performance. She did a performance at um, 
the museum by my house. I don't remember the name of it. That car museum. LACMA? Yeah. Or, yes, oh, LACMA, somewhere mm-hmm. around there. Um, and like not a lot of interviews, which mm-hmm. is interesting to me. Because I think what maybe what the interviews is they want, they don't want people to ask her what the songs are about. Oh. So instead they want her to perform the songs and to counteract the that. criticism of the first year and be like, hey, look, she can perform. And it's ramping up for her tour. Yes. Because she's about to go on tour next year. So also, I don't know if she's announced her opener yet, but I'm very interested to see who it's going to be. Ooh, her I don't know if she has, but I think like, because she has Gray? star power. Another thing I want to talk about, Olivia Rodrigo, speaking of Conan Gray, Olivia does not do any collabs. And I think it is a very admirable thing to do as yeah. an artist to get that successful, to win three Grammys on your first album with no features yeah. is impressive. But I want to see her do some collabs with people. Like an Olivia and Conan Gray song would Eat it up. Are you kidding me? I know. And they're like best friends. They're best friends. And I will say Conan Gray is a really great performer. Like I saw Conan Gray at Outside Lands and the boyfriends of all of my friends we were with, like the most straightest like, football, <laughs> like American yeah. grown men have not stopped talking about Conan Gray since. Low Obsessed key, with Conan Gray since. Let's talk about it. I think Conan Gray's song releases this year were some of the most underrated out of anybody. And it's such an 80s Killing me. Synth. Yes. He is Da-da. leaning into this 80s branding. So is Troy Zavon, kind of. And mm-hmm. I think it's like weirdly, I have a theory that it's queer people love it so much because in the 80s, we didn't have queer icons making music like this. So it's like the first time you get to hear that sort of 80s sound and it's a man singing about a man. I don't, at least to me, I that's the way that. I perceived it. Or they like, couldn't be out. Yeah, exactly. It, it wasn't as like acceptable. So I love when that. I hear uh, someone who was a favorite YouTuber of mine in 2014 getting 80s in a music, I don't know. I really love it. And it, it makes me feel seen that. in a way that mm-hmm. I didn't. Um, mm-hmm. But I could also totally see Olivia collabing with like, I mean, prior to this, I would have said Paramore. I thought they would have ate. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about a Paramore feature on Guts and how much that would have ate it up? It would have ate it up. I want to see her do Coachella and I want the surprise performance to be Haley Williams. Imagine at that part, you know, when she screams in All ah, American B. Ah, yeah. I'm in the business of misery. Let's take it to the top. And Haley Williams walks out on the stage. Oh my God. What did that eat? Sahara tent. Call Sahara, us. I will scream, Sahara. girl. I will scream. I'll rip my clothes off that in that moment. So- I can see her headlining Coachella this year. Totally. It's, It'd be a great she's move. She's due for it. It she's would be a great move. It. Um, and Coachella loves to put on the new people. They're really yeah. known, like Doja, another mm-hmm. example. They're like, whenever someone's hot, they love to put yeah. them as a headliner. Um, so that'd be really, really cool to see. Yeah. But that was kind of like the summary of my Olivia research. What I really want to talk about is this comparison of people who have blown up in this overnight way versus people who have talked about who have blown up in this slow burn way. Because when I think of the overnight formula in the early 2000s and 2010s i think it was like a nightmare a lot of the time like you think of the britney spears you think of the justin biebers you think of the miley cyruses they all went through it at some point when i think about it in 2023 the olivia's the ice spices it kind of works out in their favor more often than not but we also haven't seen them long enough that's true Brittany, it worked out in her favor. That's true. And then it didn't. You yeah. know, like it was traumatic yeah. for her. That's true. We don't know if it's traumatic that, for them That yet. is a very great point. But my original theory as to why this was, was the internet gives artists leverage against labels that didn't exist before. Mm-hmm. So like, I'm sure Ice Spice's record deal is much better than the average starting artist. Because after she had put out, mm-hmm. you know, Munch, Boys a Liar, Bikini Bottom, Princess Diana, like all these, um, Delhi. like remember when she was blowing up on TikTok? Yeah. They're going to write her a night, you know what I mean? They're going to give her a better offer because some, if they don't, somebody else will. You know what I mean? Like she's in demand. And I think when you think about the music industry, what it used to be, it was like, you're nothing, sign to us, we can make you something. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, you're something, sign with us, we can now give you resources to do the physical aspects of the industry, like touring and mm-hmm. stuff you can't do. But- when there is this built-in audience beforehand, it makes it so I think leverage. they aren't getting ripped off as much, which oh, is a yeah. good thing. Leverage. Yeah, leverage. And when you compare Olivia to Sabrina Carpenter, where she had to do that five-album deal until she could write emails I can't send, mm-hmm. which is her sixth album, and then blew up from it. And you don't see the Olivias of the world getting into that type of situation. Yeah, you're so right. And I think that like the 
I wonder how Sabrina felt when the Deja Vu came out and people like she, I feel like Sabrina went into hiding for like a year, like saying like absolutely awful things. She had just worked, just got out of her five album contract with Disney, had been in the game for almost 10 years and everything was taken away from her in that moment. That's probably where that raw came from for emails I can't send. Like, because I like, yeah. she's probably like, I have nothing anymore. I'm just going to go for it. I mean, I think that's what happened with Because I Like a Boy. I yeah. think that was literally what the song was about. Yeah. Was her just like, because yeah. I like a boy. Like, why? Yes. what did I do? Yeah. You know what I mean? And also she, one of the lines in the song is, um, you weren't even together when we met, which is true. Yeah. Which is true. So it's like, I don't know. It's just weird. Yeah. Um, But another thing I was really thinking about when it comes to these slow burn people too, like I, because I think if you think about the last two years. Mm -hmm. I think the two biggest artists of the last two years were uh, 2021 Doja, 2022 mm. Lizzo. I would say yeah. were two big break, right breakthroughs. And they were both these big slow burns where yes. it was like their fourth, fifth, sixth album. Mm -hmm. And, but like one Grammys for yeah. them and hit this, you know, mainstream media peak. Um, and it's interesting because I think when you hear Lizzo and Doja talk, they always talk about having issues with their labels in the past. Mm -hmm. So it is interesting that, you know, there is this merit to the instant, yeah. like getting lucky and having that instant rise. Yeah. Um, but I do think you get that criticism. Like that's the, the yeah. backlash of like a Sabrina gets to hone her craft. Sabrina's first big tour, she's killing it. Yes. Olivia's first big tour, she got killed. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, not, yes. yeah. And I think that's a great example of seeing it cross yes. over where it's like, yeah, Sabrina had to go through a lot of stuff, but when she got the opportunity, she was ready for yes. it. Yes. But when it comes to Olivia, she w was like still recovering from like the last opportunity before them being like, you need to go on tour now. You need to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I, I also think that there's not a right answer, which is why it's interesting to talk about. But I think also the answer is that no one like this is the thesis of everything and i know it's like oh you guys talk about fame a lot it's like we work in marketing our job is to figure out attention you know yeah no one knows how or when or why they will get famous mm -hmm. or how no one can decide that you cannot write it in your calendar you don't know when it's going to happen you don't you can work at it and i think hard work creates lucky opportunities but you do not know what the tipping point will ever be. And I think that people just have to learn how to deal with the cards that they are dealt. Dude. Like you don't know what you're going to yes. be dealt. Yes. I have a random metaphor that you're going to hate, <laughs> but it's like, so it's just applies to this perfectly. And I need to talk about it. Okay. Um, so, you know, this a piece of my lore, fun fact for all the podcast out, listeners out there. Um, I used to play Yu-Gi-Oh! Yes. <laughs> and, so like that's a game talking about drawing the cards that you're dealt. There is like a thing in Yu-Gi-Oh sometimes where like, you know, you're going to lose the game, right? Like you can tell. So you're like part of the strategy is like the correct play is like, well, if there's a 90% chance I'm going to lose, unless I draw this one specific card in my deck, then your goal should be like, how do I put myself in the best situation so that if I get lucky on that 1% chance, I know that I'll win. And if I don't, I was going to lose anyways. It's like putting yourself up in the position to get oh. lucky. And I think so much of fame is exactly like that, where it's not even about getting lucky a hundred times. It's just like, are you willing to put yourself in a position to get lucky as many times, right? Because nobody's going to be luckier than the other person. But if you do 50 auditions and the other person does five. It's not because the person who did 50 was luckier. Mm -hmm. It's because they did 50 auditions. You know exactly. what I mean? And I think that that, I don't know, sorry for the weird video analogy, that. but like, that's just something that I really like resonated with me. And I thought of, cause like you would do that all the time. I love that because, uh, it's like that saying fortune favors the bold. Yeah. Like you're going to, we're all going to be unlucky. Most of the time we just have to be bold so that when we get lucky, it's like, extra lucky yeah when you're when you get your re moment you're ready for yes. it because you're probably not going to get two or three moments like that no. exactly and i think like you i love like the kind of thesis you had too where people were really brutal i remember randomly these like moments where i was at a festival in vegas it was life is beautiful and just so happened that weekend they had the iheart radio festival in vegas so it was mm -hmm. like hard to get hotels and it was just yep. this big thing and it was olivia rodrigo's first i think live performance and i remember at the hotel room, I wanted to see how she did. Like I yeah. was curious, I was a new fan and I was watching videos of her 
and people were brutal. And it was like, I think it could have been career ending for her. And I think that she kind of pulled back from live performances for a while. She did. And then really honed her craft. And it's why, like you said, she's really going performances. I think so. And I think they're also doing it as practice yeah. for a tour. And I I would even equate like what happened to her to the same thing of like Dua Lipa. Yeah. Where she got sh- so much for being a bad dancer. And then she went in a cave. And suddenly she came out. The, at the Dancing with the Stars winner. Like yes. just busting moves. Even her new music video for Houdini is just her in a dance studio just yeah. dancing. Like, Killing it. She, Killing it. Yeah. Did you see the one girl on TikTok who claimed that Olivia Rodrigo's SNL performance was a copy of her music video? No, I didn't. Okay. Is it? No. <laughs> I love trauma like this. Okay. I know. And, and I'm not, you can tell the girl tried to approach it in a nice way. And I do think it's one of those things where after the Taylor Swift and Paramore thing, people will just like whether they're doing it on purpose or not, but will falsely claim that Olivia Rodrigo copied them because they know it's viral. Yep. They know that people are waiting to be yep. like, she always copies people. Yep. She said that it was because Olivia Rodrigo's all-American bitch performance was a tea party. And like the, and then the girl, at one point I was like, ooh, but then I was like, nah. There was one video where it was like, she did a photo shoot once where she had red lipstick on a mirror and then Olivia did, but I feel like people have done that. I hate, I remember when the bad idea, right? When she was doing a red lipstick, people were like, she's, there she goes copying Taylor again. I was like. Inventing red lipstick. Like I was like, yeah. yeah. I was like, girl, like you think that she invented red lipstick? Yeah. It was one of those things. And the tea party thing was just like, and then the girl was like playing her music video in between clips. And I'm like, this is getting more attention than anything like now. But I do think that kind of like, whether it was on purpose or not, like that kind of marketing gimmick does more damage than good to be like, someone's copying me. And then like, if they aren't, it's like, girl. And also it's like, even if it gets a lot of views, which is probably why people try to do it, it's not going to drive conversions. And that's what you have to think about when it's music. Nobody's like, wow, this song was a tea party well, sign me up. Like, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You know what well, I mean? Like, it's just not, and you don't that's not wanna, how you get somebody to fall in love with the song. You it's don't never going to create an emotional connection to it. Exactly. You never want to be compared to someone who's like really, really great too, because you'll never yeah. be able to compare. Yeah. You don't want to compare yourself to somebody who won three Grammys on their first album. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You're always you're probably gonna let, not going to do that. Like you're always going to let them down when yeah. they then go watch your stuff. Unfortunately, yeah. it's just how it is. It's why you see some of these newer artists hate when they get called like the next blah, blah, blah. Cause they're like, you're setting me up to fail. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be the next lady Gaga. Yeah. Like it is setting me up for failure, you know? So totally. I think that it, yeah. But I just thought that was an interesting thing. And I think it ties into what you said. And I think it's like now a catchy headline to be like Olivia Rodrigo. It is a catchy headline. Um, but I also, something I wanted to bring up that I forgot is I think like a big reason I think for Olivia's success and also Sabrina's success is they both been really smart about, I think, finding lanes that nobody else is really doing right now. Mm. So I think Olivia is, it's like this Avril Lavigne, it's like this Paramore style, you know, kind of pop punky yeah. girl rock, right? That no one is not super popular in 2005, mm. kind of has seen a resurgence with like the Lana Barkers of the world and yeah. like the Jaden Hostlers of the world, but like has not been popular from a women's standpoint, really. And she's kind of bringing that mm. back, which I love. And then Sabrina Carpenter leaned into this, like, uh, we talked about, like, shameless sexuality yeah. branding, where she's literally, like, will be on stage and say she wishes somebody would rearrange her organs. Yes. You know what I mean? And, like, that goes so viral every single time. And I think it's also something that if you're an artist out there thinking is, like, um, I think a lot of the people who have been able to cut through recently really have a strong, like, point of view in terms of like either sound or branding mm-hmm. or uh, you know the way they carry themselves even like yes. Sabrina to me is just like the way she carries herself it's yeah. like she's so shameless and she'll say absolutely anything um, and even in the interviews like she's so funny about it like one of them was like I saw recently is like where do you get your inspiration for your out- nonsense outros and she's like oh trust me you don't want to know because oh it's like God. talking about her in the bedroom do you get I like love that. she's so like she's so good at it Sabrina Carpenter reminds me of an early Katy Perry Interesting. Like the, I a girl, the bubble gum, like the like raunchy lyrics, but like, like I was even doing research for a TikTok that we posted recently, and Katy Perry had an outfit from her blue hair era like 10 years ago, and it's a red heart cutout corset. We and I was like, 
We the- need to see an artist bring back just like crazy camp. I'm talking 2010s Katy Perry, Lady Gaga. I know. Like, and we don't really get that anymore. So, but it's because like that could be another episode for another day. Music videos don't bring the same return anymore. They're not making money on them. Like, it's just like, I think that there's a whole other convo. I have so many conversations with people about yeah. this, about the whole music video problem. And the touring problem yeah. is another big one. Um, because it's weird. Going back to Sabrina Carpenter, I think the only thing that I've ever seen, the only social content that sells tour tickets is content of artists on tours. And that's the you paradox. You have to be on tour to do it. That's the paradox. Mm-hmm. The label's like, well, we need to sell the tickets before the tour. And you're like, okay, well, like I need to be on the tour to sell yes. the tickets. And that's why Sabrina Carpenter blew up with the nonsense outros and why she could do something like Eras, mm-hmm. but it's because they had all of that footage of her already on tour. Yeah. And I think that, I don't know, it's just like another thing when I've ever talked to artist point. clients of them like that is I'm like, you got to milk those on stage opportunities when you get them. That's such a good point. I never even thought about that. And yeah, I became aware of Sabrina Carpenter's music because of the nonsense outros. Well, I think that was kind of like a long, uh, two-parter i don't know i kind of how have you felt about i like the two-part episodes they're fun to me i love when podcasts do a two-part episode because it makes me understand that they have so much content they couldn't fit it into one yeah and it makes me want to go back the next week yeah so let us know if you guys want more of these two-parters yeah and we have some really really exciting our next episode if you're seeing this will be that was not on my 2023 bingo card (laughs) yeah and then the next one is, is us predictions for 2024 and that I, will be our finale our finale and thank you so much for all the love in this yeah. first year guys it's been like what two months we've been doing this three months i know um, and we have loved every second of it so don't forget to subscribe comment please leave us a rating on spotify or yes. where you listen to your podcasts and we share love you it with lots. a friend share with a friend bye, bye.